This is the story of a problem that everyone thinks has been solved, but it's still smoldering away, even today, and threatening life on our planet. It's about chemicals, which are creating a huge hole in the ozone layer over the South Pole, reducing the Earth's protection against the dangerous ultraviolet radiation of the sun. The result, a dramatic increase in skin cancer. The international community reacted early, back in 1987, in Montreal. We are here today because we recognize that urgent action is necessary to prevent destruction of the atmosphere's protective ozone shield. The draft protocol you have in front of you proves that we can act when our scientists tell us that we can move before the full magnitude of the disaster is upon us. In bedenklicher Weise wird die Ozonschicht angegriffen, die uns vor ultravioletten Strahlen schützt. Deshalb wird die Bundesregierung international auf ein Verbot von gefährlichen Treibgasen bestehen. We have begun to fight an important battle and at last there is hope. But no one reckoned at the time with criminals who were dealing in banned chemicals and still are. Eco-crimes. What you're about to see is not fiction. Some scenes have been reenacted, but everything in the film is based on documents and witnesses' statements, on records and court decisions. All the people who conducted investigations in this case appear in person. This film shows what really happened. The story covers a period of over 10 years, beginning in autumn 1995 on the executive floor of the TTI Chemical Company. The company produces something that's long been banned in Europe and the USA. CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons. Chemicals which are used in fire extinguishers, spray cans and coolants, and which destroy the Earth's vital ozone layer. But China and other threshold states and developing countries enjoy special rights. They're allowed to continue producing CFCs. TTI exploits these special rights to continue selling the ozone killers worldwide. May 1996, Europe's largest port. More than 80 ocean-going giants put in here every day. A ship from China is lying at the quayside. There's little time for checking and none at all for analyzing chemicals. Time is money. Until then, no one here had ever shown any interest in CFCs from China. A container truck sets off, heading for Frankfurt, Germany, unchallenged. In the mid-90s, the European Union trusts everyone to stick to the rules of the Montreal Protocol. What we would like to see is that there is more information exchanged between the different um, members and parties of the Montreal Protocol and for them to inform each other on a voluntary basis about the import and the export that takes place. The following scene is reenacted according to the evidence of the investigators who appear as themselves. The Typhoon fire extinguisher manufacturer needs CFCs for its products. But CFC production has been banned in the industrialized countries. 
and since the 1st of January 1996, they can no longer be imported into the EU. That puts Georg Gudemann, Typhoon's managing director, in a dilemma. But he's found a way out. Dealing in recycled CFCs from old fire extinguishers and refrigerators is still allowed. He intends to sell 365 tons, but he's only bought two tons of recycled CFCs, legally and officially, from the German armed forces. The rest he comes by in other ways. The driver knows that his load comes from China, nothing else. Imports from China are a matter of routine for him, and he's never had any problems. But since the 1st of January, 96, there have been a lot of changes at customs in the EU. The list of banned substances is long, just as long as the list of legal, harmless substances that can replace them. No easy job for a customs officer to keep track of everything and check the import papers of the Typhoon Company. Papers are no problem for Gudeman. His customers want a slip showing that the whole consignment consists of legal, recycled goods. But the amount of recycled CFCs Gudeman is offering simply doesn't exist. So he's come up with an idea. A manipulated invoice from the armed forces. At a stroke, he turns two tons of recycled CFCs into 365. In Frankfurt, the customs officer wants to take a look at the chemicals destined for Typhoon. The seal on the container from Rotterdam is intact. Everything seems to be okay. The container is full of R227, a legal substitute for the ozone killers, manufactured in China. The customs officer can't check what's actually in the bottles, just the papers. He has no testing equipment. So the consignment finds its way into the EU without any problem. One of many. Early 1997. Europe's financial capital, with a turnover of billions every day. Among the bankers is someone who's after very different figures. Julian Newman of the Environmental Investigation Agency, the EIA. A small non-governmental organization specializing in environmental crime. Julian's on his way to the Chamber of Commerce because he harbors a suspicion. He can't believe that all countries are abiding by the Montreal Protocol. He's particularly interested in the developing and threshold nations, which enjoy well-intentioned special provisions. To give them more time to switch over to the expensive substitutes, they're allowed to carry on producing the ozone killers up until 2010, but only for their own needs an interim arrangement. That's the idea. Russia. Julian is going through the countries with special rules. Since the Montreal Protocol has come into force, production of CFCs there must have declined. And so it has. Russia has recorded a drop of 87% over 10 years. Then China. Over the same period, the picture is very different. Production has actually increased by 300%. I think this case shows the problems of enforcement. It's easy for governments to sit down in 1987 and agree they're going to save the ozone hole and then a few years.